What a mighty God. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless you. We worship you. Holy Spirit, we give you all the adoration and honor. We give you all the exaltation. Have your way, O Lord, that your name will be glorified. Blessed be thy holy name, O Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Rebagashi kataba, rakata sokotobo. We thank you for life. We thank you for healing. We thank you for prosperity. We thank you for advancement. Mazukotorobo, rakata shikataba. In the name of Jesus Christ. Rakoto shakataba. Holy Ghost, we bless you. God bless you. Sister Stacy, God bless you. God bless you. Tonight is going to be a great night. We have been having some kind of network reach. That's why you were not able to reach us. Um, but God bless you as we have connected now. Tonight we are talking about the reason for souls. The reason we win. The reason that we win souls. The reason why we should win souls. What are the reasons? We talked about winning souls last week. So it was win, win, win. But today we... We, we talk about, we are talking about the reasons for winning. What are the reasons why I should be a soul winner? In the name of Jesus, God bless you, Sister Marilyn, Stella, and others. Everyone that is online, God bless you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we worship you, Lord. We give you all the glory and adoration. We exalt, we magnify you. Have your way, O Lord. Labogo shakataba. In the name of Jesus, the Bible said, all of our the entrance of the word bringeth light and understanding to the simple. Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Let the word that we speak and hear not be an enticing word of a man, but let it be the word of God that we bring glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So we are talking about reasons for winning souls. We are reading our book, the G12 book. Ladder of Success, I am today at page 61. If you have your book, you can go with us. Reasons for winning souls. Number one reason, God values them. God values souls. So everything that God values is what we should value. Hallelujah. So if God values anything as a child of God, that's where our value will be. So if God values souls, I have to value souls. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 8, 36. Mazika Taraba, Rakata Shakataba. Matthew chapter 8, verse 36, so God values souls. One of the reasons why we win them is because they are of value to God. They are valuable to God. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 8, I want you to see verse 36. And we are going to read them. We are going to explain it a little bit. In the name of Jesus Christ. Rakoto shakataba. Rebaga sikanama. Makikorobo sokotobo. Rekata. Oh, Mark chapter 8, not Matthew. Mark chapter 8, 36, sorry. Mark 8.36, in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's see what the Bible say here. Look at verse 36 of Mark chapter 8, in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, Lord, we bless you, we worship you. He said, they also who had seen it told them by what means he who had seen demons possessed was healed. Because God has value for them. No, I read it. Luke, Mark 8, 36. I read the wrong place, sorry. He said, for what will it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? That is what the Bible is saying. What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world? So the value of a soul is an equivalent of the whole world. If you know what the world is, the world is all the systems of the world. Talking, as, talk, talk, talking about the United States of America is a system. The United Nations is a system. World Health Organization is a system. If you bring all these nations that you gather them together, it's a big system. God value the one soul as the whole world. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man? So if you put it in form of business, the word they profit is only when you do business or when you work, you get profit. He said, what shall it profit a man? To gain the whole world and lose their soul. So the value of one soul is equivalent to the whole world. So if God values a soul, I have to value a soul. We are talking about reasons for winning. Why do we win souls? 
Why do we win souls? Yesterday we talked about how Peter was being converted and after Jesus converted him, he was so excited and uh, Jesus said, don't worry about what you have seen for I will make you fishers of men. I will give you the grace to win men. You have to go out there and win men. Everything we do in the kingdom is not for us, it's for somebody else. When God gives you a privilege to be part of the kingdom, that means you are marked to win other people in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's move forward in some of the reasons. Why do we win soul? Number one, I told you God valued them. Then number two, ah, la karaba shukotobo. God has value for them. Ezekiel chapter 8, 18, verse 4. What God values, what we are going to be valuing from today. Today is our Bible study, so be, please bear with me if I'm not um, jumping everywhere. I just want to teach so we can get it. We are reading the ladder of success. We are in page 63 now. Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel chapter 18. And we are reading verse 4. If you have your book, you can read along with me. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. The value that God has for souls. He said, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sin shall die. But if a, a man is just and does what is lawful and right, he has not eaten of the mountain nor lifted up their eyes to the idols of the house of Israel. Then God said here, nor defied his neighbor's wife, nor appropriate a woman duly for impurity. Then all these things, if the person did not do it, then I will, I will, I will take them. They are mine. But God said every soul, the, the focus is in verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. All, not some. The criminal the thief out there, the, 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 the confused person, the mad man, the unbeliever, the atheist. The Bible says all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul of the soul who sin shall die. We are not focusing on those that continue to sin, but we are focusing on the soul that is a um, sober soul. That's what I'm trying to say, a prepared soul that... We have all done something and we continue to do things, but God is an infinite God that has mercy. He's a merciful God. So we go to souls, we present the almighty God, the loving God, the kind God, the God that has grace and power. We present it to them. So God says, every soul is mine. So the value of soul is that God loved them. God valued them. Jesus said in John chapter 3, he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son in verse 16. And whosoever believes in him, hallelujah, should not perish but have everlasting life. So there's a, an inheritance that has been prepared for an unbelieving soul. God has already packaged their inheritance and keep for them. And he's waiting. So we have to go out there and begin to talk to as many souls that we can get to bring them to the presence of God. These are one of the reasons why we win souls also. Number two is Jesus paid the highest price. Last time I posted something on my Facebook, I don't know, maybe it's two or three weeks ago. We talked about the price that was paid for our souls. I said the, the, the bride price for the church was the most expensive one and the, 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 the highest one. The church is his bride. He has to pay a dowry and the dowry was his life. The blood of Jesus st stands as the Mark of the covenant of the marriage. So, number two, the number one is God values souls. Number two is that Jesus paid the highest price for every soul. Every soul that is in the kingdom has been paid for. The one that is outside there has been paid for. The one that is not yet born that will sin tomorrow has been paid for. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. Let's go to First Peter chapter 1. We are reading verse 18. And 19. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. I want you to see that the price has been paid. God is not owing anything. Whatever the devil asks as a price was given to him. Hallelujah. Every price for souls has already been paid in full. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18. So we just have to go out there and begin to harvest them. How do we harvest them? By talking to them. I talked about it in the morning while I was doing my work. Uh, on the trail 
a pack. I was talking about confessing. It's when you confess, it's just you say something. Confession is the greatest weapon that God has given to us as Christians. And that is what delivers us. The Bible says if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Christ died and was resurrected for our sins, then we are sons of God. We, have, we are saved. We are forgiven. Then that same confession, we have to take it now to the street and begin to confess the goodness of Christ to man. Confess it to somebody else, our brothers and sisters. We begin to, the confession that we give is what brings people to this kingdom. So, First Peter chapter 1, look at verse 18 in the name of Jesus Christ. We are reading verse 18 and 19. The prize that was paid for your sin and my sin. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. You were not bought. You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from, from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as of the Lamb without blemish and without spot. So we were not purchased. We were not bought. We were not brought into the kingdom. We, we were not redeemed. Another word to buy something is to redeem. Like when they say you, you take out something on the shop, you put out for layaway, and you come back say, I want to redeem my pledge. I want to redeem my, 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 my debt. And you get that thing that you have pledged for. Jesus Christ did not wait. He paid it in full. Not with gold or silver. Not with the precious stones. Not with oil. Not with Bitcoin. Not with dollars or pounds. He paid with his, his blood. So the, the price for the souls have been paid. That's why I told you this number two point is Jesus has already paid the highest price. So the souls are already paid for. Our job is go out there and win them. How hard is that? Talking to somebody. Hallelujah. God bless you. Just go out there and begin to expand the reach. Begin to speak to as many that can hear you. And if you have spoken to somebody before, speak to them again. And they, they hear you, maybe they didn't accept or receive, go back and speak to them. And they hear you, go back and speak to them. After a while, you see, the walls will be broken down and their heart and their soul will be receptive and begin to receive the word. And the word will begin to penetrate into them. Jesus paid the price. It's a very stiff price. It's a very expensive price. But he paid it. Hallelujah. There's a song they used to sing. I can't remember all the words, but the song goes this way. Say, uh, I owe the debt. He did not owe. He paid the price. I did not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. I think something like this. I owe the debt. I did not pay. He paid the debt that I owed. I needed someone to wash my sins away. Oh, now I am done. And a new song, Amazing Grace. Lord Jesus paid the price that I could never pay. I couldn't pay that price. I was the one that owed that debt, but he came and paid it in full. And he paid and gave some tip on top of it. The blood of Jesus is so precious. It's more than everything. But the Bible says he paid the price already. So we just have to go out there and begin to win souls. Our job is go and make God happy. Heaven full, hell empty. That's what we are preaching. Everything about salvation ends up to one thing. Soul winning. The benefits that we get in the kingdom, the healing, the, 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 the prosperity, all these other things, is not why we become Christian. Christianity, the aim and the goal to be a Christian is to be fruitful. How do we be a fruitful Christian? Is to win people that like look like us. People that are in the same caliber of as us. People that are in the same status as us. People that are in the same capacity as us. We just go back and win the same people. And God we call different people and send them out. So the price for the souls have been paid. Mazo Kotorobo. Rekatara. The only way to be saved is through faith in Christ. I said it about it in the morning. First, first um, John chapter, chapter 1 verse 9. He said if we confess our sin that Jesus said that he will forgive us. 
Hallelujah. And cleanse us. The cleansing is not our job. A lot of people come and say, oh, I want to get clean first. I want to stop smoking. I want to stop cheating. I want to stop lying. I want to do... No, it's not your job. Come the way you are. But don't remain the way you are. That's the key. Come and God will take time to begin to wash you. Begin to cleanse you. Because he's a mighty God. He's a loving God. He's a great God. He's a wonderful God. Mazokoto. The only way to be saved is by Jesus Christ. So we just have to go and let God begin to cleanse us. John chapter 8, 24. John chapter 8, 24. I want you to open your Bible to the book of John. You can write it down. Chapter 8, verse 24. I want you to see something here. Mazokoto. John chapter 8. Look at verse 24. So, the only way, the only way to come to God is through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. Every other way that you hear out there, they are fake. He said, therefore, I say to you, John chapter 8, verse 24, that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. The only way, the only way is him. Hallelujah. If you don't believe me, then that's it. If you look at, if you go further backward, Jesus was telling the Jews, these are his brethren, the people that he knows how they live. He said, I am the only access to get to God. If you don't believe me, then you will die. The believing in me, which is Jesus Christ, not me, is that he is the only access. The Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no one, nobody. Come to my father except by me. Even if you know that God is inside this room and you decide to break the roof and get in, the angels of God will carry you, bundle you, and throw you back out. There is a door. The door is Jesus Christ. If you don't have the access to the house, if you jump through the roof, you are a thief. The Bible says, He that comes through the window is a thief. You don't have to get in as a thief, you have to go through the door. There's a door, and the door there is Jesus Christ. I am the way. There is no other way to God. He is the only way. So how hard is that? If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ died for our sins and we will be saved. How hard is that? Why can't we just go and do the work? It is an easy thing to do. So I indulge us today by the authority and the power in the name of Jesus Christ to go out there and begin to win souls for Christ. To go and begin to win souls for Christ. Because it is what God values. What God values. If God values something, that's what I will value. Because we are created in his image and likeness. And God has called us to do things that will please him. That's all he needs from us. Souls. God does not care how many billions you give him. If you are not a profitable Christian. If you cannot give him a soul. A lot of people will say, I build church in your name. And say, I don't know you. Some people will say, I delivered people in your name. God will say, I don't know you. Some people will say, I have thousands of people following me in your name. God will say, I don't know you. Your primary job is to win souls. Because most of the things that we do, even as a pastor, the things that God allowed me to do is not for my glory, it's for his glory. Woe, woe unto me if I go and take the glory of God. Whatever experience that God allowed me to experience is for his glory. So my job is to always make God happy. The Bible says when one soul comes to God, there is joy in heaven. One soul. God does not demand many. Start with one. One person is enough. When you win one person, the joy to get one soul will make you to go back and get the second soul. And the, the, the second soul. And the third soul. And the fourth soul. And you just keep going. And before you know it, everybody that is on your chain, if they do the same thing, at the end, many of us will not know how how many impacts we have made on earth until we get to heaven and you start to see Jesus Christ and they will open the book of record and you look at millions of people attached to you. You say, but I didn't speak to millions. You didn't know that one man you spoke to get crazy and went out and began to fill the whole place. He's still under your tree. There's going to be a crown. The Bible says every work shall be tested with fire. So people that are walking and their works are going to be wood. The Bible says when the fire burn it down, their work will be small because it was burnt. Un incorruptible work. Go and do the work. The work is soul. Souls is very, very necessary for God. 
It doesn't matter whether the soul come to where you go. You can win soul and they are somewhere else. We are not in competition in the kingdom. The kingdom is a kingdom of completion. But your job is to make them heaven full, hell empty. That's our job here. Understand your calling. Every child of God has a calling. Did you know what you are called to do? Maybe one day I'm going to talk about purpose. I think I've thought thought about it in a church sometime. But I'm going to open our eyes to see where you when you understand, then to, you will not be confused. When you understand your calling, let's go to Romans chapter 1, verse 14. Understanding your calling. Number two. Romans chapter 1, verse 14. Masse Ketereva. You should stay in where you are called. When you understand, then you become outstanding. Your understanding in life is what sets you apart. Once you understand, you are now going to be set apart for greatness. Understanding is what gives you wisdom. Understanding is what amplifies knowledge. When you have knowledge without understanding, it's almost useless because you cannot apply what you have learned. The Bible said in verse Romans chapter 1, hallelujah, verse 14, are we there? I am a debt, a debtor to both Greek and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. I am a debtor. Paul was talking to himself now. So as much as it is me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. He said, I am indebted to everyone that stands in front of me. I'm indebted to both Greek and to the barbarians. Hallelujah. To speak to them. Paul still said, woe be thou me if I don't preach the word of God. How many of us are obsessed with the word of God? That you say, I'm indebted to do the will of God. I'm indebted. It's like when you are in debt, you cannot have rest until you have done that the will of that person that you are owing, whatever contract agreement that you sign, if you are in debt of resources or you are in debt to bring a service and you have not completed that job, you can't rest until the job is done. He said, I am indebted. How many of us are indebted to the will of God, to understanding what God wants? Hallelujah. Why do we win souls? Why? Why? The reason why we win souls, you are redeemed. The redemption is the understanding that you are above all things. The greatest sinner and the only is the only thing that can save you from the sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. You need to identify your sins, confess it and believe it in God. Renounce it. And God will remove it. God is the one that removes. We don't go and say, let me stop. I remember when we started um, preaching when I was very, very young in the late 90s. And then we joined church. I was still having some things that are following me up and down from my past. Even I tried to cut my friends off, but some characters didn't leave me. The man of God I was having then, every time he comes to me again, he look at me and say, don't worry, I pray for you. I, I thank God for the kind of pastor the, the God brought to me early on. I could have left church because if he had said one word, one, one nasty word to me, that would be the end of me coming there because I was not matured enough to understand things. But this man loved me unconditionally. You know, he loved me. Most times, by the time I would come into church, I would be going, I would go and take some weed and go out there in the park and smoke weed and be very high. And I'll come there, whatever they are saying, I'm listening, but I can't articulate it. My mind is wavering everywhere. And I'll just be dazed. But the man keep loving me, he keep pushing on me, he keep calling me, he keep bringing me. I was coming. I was obsessed with the things of God, but I couldn't stand because there are demons fighting in my life. It took about a couple of years before God totally rooted those things out. But one thing is that I never miss service. I never miss weekly activities, church service. In fact, the pastor, I, I was like his driver. He calls me anytime I had a car, he didn't have a car. So I will carry him to one meeting, to the other meeting, to this meeting, to that meeting. And the moment I have opportunity to go and smoke, I will go and smoke. But this demon fought me until God delivered me. But I could have quit because I say I want to cleanse first. I don't want this man to know that I'm a smoker. But the man didn't care. He keep pouring into me. 
He poured it to me. You are a sinner. Come the way you are, but don't remain the way you are. God transformed me. When I look at my life, some of my friends, I say, what? What a God. How did I end up here? Hallelujah. How did I finally become a pastor? But that's the will of God. When you submit yourself, confess your sins, you can't change yourself. Nobody changes anybody. Even father and mother, you can't change your son or daughter. You can direct them, you can give them things to do, try to put them in the right path. If they don't want to change, especially adults, I don't care how many kind of punishment. Haven't you seen people that go to jail? They get go to jail and come back, they become worse. They go to jail and come back, they become worse. The more you put them in jail, the more they are becoming hardened and very, very terrible. In fact, after a while, they will become worse than the, the state can control. They will just confine them there, leave them for life. Because the jail is not to correct. It's a correction place. That's what they call it. But people are high. Demons will take over the person's life. But when you assimilate somebody in the society, you just keep talking to them. Confessing God is nothing but just talking to somebody. Telling them how good they are, how God has created them wonderfully and fearfully made, how God has put great things in their life. And this man, he, he, he kind of taught me earlier. In fact, my foundation was a very good one because he made me to understand that everyone has value in them. There are some people you see them today, they don't, they don't have anything to offer you as a child of God. But you pour into them until, I remember when Paul was talking about the Philippian church. He met them, they were poor, there was a poorer church Paul met. He started that church in Philippians. But before church, Paul retired, the church of Philippians became the biggest and the most successful church. Why? Because they understood the principle and Paul keep pouring into them and keep pouring into them and keep pouring into them and keep writing letters and keep pouring. The, 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 the psychedelic church, the church of the city, the church of Corinthians, they were not, they had everything. They were very successful. There were no women there that has resources. They were just very, very chaotic. It was a dis, disorganized church. But the Philippian church was a poor church, but they became the greatest church because they learned the principles of God and began to follow it. At the time, they gave so much gift to Paul. Paul said, wow, my God will supply all your needs. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Even when I didn't need anything, you keep sending me gifts. These are poor people. I'm telling you, poor people there. And God bless them and keep blessing them because they understood principle. So, when you, God give you an assignment on somebody, maybe it's your brother, your sister, your father, your mother, your neighbor, your grandson, your granddaughter, don't quit on them. They might say, don't talk to me again. Yeah, you might stop talking to them if they're going to be violent with you, but you start to pray. When the cloud is full, rain shall fall. Souls are very important. And sometimes there are some souls that God will give you an assignment and send you to them. They will be the most stubborn souls you have met on earth. Everything you say, they want to argue, they want to counter, they want to, you know, they'll be very, very stubborn. But it's not your job to change them. You just keep giving them the love and keep pouring love into them and keep sharing the word of God. And the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing but the word of God as they continue to hear and they continue to hear and they continue to hear. Before you know it, things will start to fall. Different scales will be peeling out. It's like taking an onion. That's what I tell people if I want to explain deliverance. Deliverance is not something people fall and get up. Haven't you seen people that fall in every occasion? Everywhere they go, they are falling, they are vomiting, they are coughing, they are doing that, and they come back, they are the same people. If a man of God that is designing deliverance is like an onion, one day I'm going to do an illustration about that. When you peel the first scale, you still see another another cover. But the onion is reducing. You keep peeling on it. You keep peeling on it. I've seen people that have anger, fierce anger. And after many years, if you talk to them, shout to them, they'll just say, ah, don't worry, don't, don't talk to them. You see the way they are. You see this man, oh, this man used to be a lion. He used to be a tiger. What happened to him? What happened to him? God have changed that person. God have removed that stony heart. You start to peel the onion. You start to pull the onion. As you are removing the back, as you are removing the, to be reducing until it will get to the last one in the middle, that's like a stem. And that's it. So you don't get delivered in one day, unless the things that are following you are just, just uh, little demons. It takes a while. Even if the demons are out of the body, the debris is still there. If there's a hurricane or a tornado that passed through a city, the hurricane will be far gone, two years, three years. People are still rebuilding their houses. Some bridges have not been hanged back. Some streams have carried away the whole road. Some roads have been washed out. Some houses are hanging the other side. The debris is there, but the storm is over. 
That's what happens in deliverance. Many of us, we have gone too far. When you get back to God, it takes time. Just relax. Don't be in a hurry with God. He got your back. God knows who you are. It took God 22 years to remove lying tongue from Jacob. 22 years of Jacob lying, I'm, I'm Esau, I'm Esau, I'm Esau. God didn't abandon him. God allowed him to pay the price. The price was steep for him also. He wasted 22 years. He could have been very, very productive. But God stood with him. And finally, he said, I am Jacob. And God said, you have fought with man and God and you have prevailed. Now you shall be called Israel. And his life changed. Hallelujah. And somebody will say, why didn't Jacob just say it when his father said, who, who, who are you? He didn't know. He thought he could have gotten away with life. There is no shortcut to life. When you get to God, you stay. So if you go out there and you are trying to win soul, some people will aggravate you. Some people will ask you dumb questions. They want to get you into this corner of debate. You don't have to debate God. You don't have to go and try to prove God. God is God. If you don't want to believe it, it's their own cup of tea. But you just love them. You just keep loving them. You just keep sharing the word and keep sharing the word. And if you don't want you to share it with them, you just share it in prayers. I'm telling you, prayer is the greatest way to reach many people without even talking to them. You can take somebody's name and begin to say, Lord, touch this, my sister, touch my neighbor, touch that doctor, touch that man, that family, in the name of Jesus. Before you know it, something will transform in their life. They may never know you are the one that did it. It's not for them to know. You are not doing it for them. You are not doing it for, 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 for show. You are not doing it for any prize. But you are doing it for yourself and to God that have called you. You know, the work we work is for God. It's not for man. They might, never, they might even be your enemies. And you love this, my enemy will not go to hell. I don't want them to die and go to hell. Lord, change them. Change, I know what they did to me is terrible, but God transformed them. You might never have to talk to them in life again. You might know where they are. But God will begin to do the work. Let us be soul winner. Win with passion. Be obsessed to win soul. In the name of Jesus Christ. You must have compassion for the lost souls. Your compassion is what draws people. When you have compassion on them, you will see what in the name of Jesus. Let's go to the Bible in the book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 to, to 8. Let's see how Jesus used compassion. And there's another place Jesus looked at them. The Bible said they were scattered like sheep that have no shepherd. And the Bible said he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them. And he looked at the disciples and said the harvest is truly plenty. But the laborers are few. They are few laborers. Can you add your name? Say, God, I want to be a laborer. Give me the grace. Give me the authority. Give me the ability. Give me the power to be able to serve. Give me the power to go and walk in the vineyard. Philippians, are we there? Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let's read from verse 5 to 8. Philippians chapter 2. Just three verses. Hallelujah. God bless you. In the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. We worship you. We exalt, we magnify you. La koto shakataba. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. What is going on here? I just had it and it just slipped off my hand. And look at what the Bible says here. It says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of bond servant. Hallelujah. And coming in the likeness of man to bring to and be found in the appearance of man. He humbled himself, hallelujah, to the obedience and the pain of death. And even to death of the cross. Jesus Christ was God. He left his throne, came down on earth. The Bible says he never considered himself to be equal to God, not equal to the Holy Spirit. He kept himself cool and humble. He kept himself down. He said, I am going to serve. He served with diligence and with all ability to win soul. 
If God can leave his throne, you know what? The throne of Jesus Christ, he have 12 elders and all the legions of the angels in heaven bow to him. But he left all that. Hallelujah. Because of his compassion. He had compassion on us. You should also know the Bible, not knowing everything in the Bible. If you are going out to win so you have to know basic things, who Christ is, who is God, and who is the Holy Spirit. Those are basic things, but the rest thing, God will take care of it. You don't have to go there to begin to quote. We are not called to be lawyers. If you go and to win so God didn't call you to argue. A lot of people will try to corner you to the corner and start to tell you some, some things to bring you to to begin to defend, you don't have to go and defend God. God can defend himself. God can hold his own. Go there and say, God is calling you. And speak to them in the language that they will understand. Whichever way that God allow you, everybody will praise differently. There's no pattern, one full pattern to win soul. You can open up a discussion. It can just be about what is going on. It can be about life. And from there, you start to talk to them. Sometimes, there's something we did in South Africa that really worked. But it's not that it's going to work everywhere. But I want to give you that format. You know, there was a time we used to go and pray for people. We don't ask them anything. We just come, hello, how are you? This is my name. This is who I am. We don't tell them what I will pass us or anything. We say, can I pray for you? Oh, well, sure. People will say, sure. Then you say, what do you want God to do for you? They will give you their hands or whatever. And you begin to pray, have agreement with them. You pray for them, you leave them, and you go. They will say, hey, hey who are you? Then conversation has started. So that one is to break the ice. You can start with that. Somebody you know, you are cheating, chatting, you are talking about something at the job. You say, hi, can I pray for you? Or can I pray with you? They say, ah, pray for me for what? He say, I just want to know maybe they are look, you are looking for something or you want God to do something for you. Let me just pray with you. People will receive you easily if you offer them prayer. So you can use that format. You can use every other format. Jesus, when he met the woman at the pool, the Bible said they started talking about the mountain and where to serve God and pick from water. Say, give me water to drink. You know, there are many, many ways. It, you just devise a means. It can be somebody you used to know from one discussion to the next discussion, then you introduce God. But let God lead you. Before you go out to win soul, pray. Say, God, I'm going out. Send me the prepared man, prepared woman, prepared people, prepared family. Lord, organize them for me. When I come, give me a word. The woman that Jesus ministered to by the pool, the Bible says she ran back to the city. She said, come and see. She didn't quote no Bible. She didn't know which Bible verse to quote. But she said, come and see a man that will tell you your past, your present, and your future. And the church was full. The same thing that Philip did to Nathaniel, his brother. He said, come and see a man. He said, where does he come from? He said, <coughs> Galilee. Say, can anything come out of Nazareth? Hallelujah. Can anything come out of Nazareth? Say, yeah, come and see. He came and he saw Jesus, and that was it. And the other man that one of the John as disciples um, um, minister, he saw Jesus and followed Jesus. Say, where do you live? Jesus said, come and see where I live. He, he came and saw it, and Jesus ministered to him. He went back and called another disciple and said, come and see this man. And they came. So it's in many, many ways you can use to get to souls. They are different ways. I can't just start to yank one out of my head, but God will give you the ability. Souls are different. Depending on what, you can be people that play golf together. You can be somebody that you go and hang out with together. You are co-worker at the mall. People you meet on the street. Maybe you can just be at the grocery store and you start to talk with somebody. Sometimes people ask you questions. Hey, I'm looking for this. Are you working here? You say, no, I just want to pick something. This discussion has begun from there. Then you start to talk to them. So, Go and win soul. Let it be soul, soul, soul. You will see what will happen in your life. Everyone that have given God a soul or souls, their life never became the same. In the name of Jesus Christ. Another thing is that you will feel, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit. To win soul is not a physical thing. It's a spiritual warfare. To convince another person and when people are frustrated, they try to be aggravating. And they, sometimes they want to be very, very um, outward they, in their approach. Or forward, not outward, forward. So they, 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 they come to you as if they are very aggressive. You just calm down and say, Holy Spirit, take over, take control. In fact, before you even speak to that person, say, God, I see this man and my spirit is leading me to the man. Give me utterance, give me utterance, give me grace and Lord, Subjecting because the Bible says before you enter into the house of a strong man, you must first bind the strong man. 
every spirit of power responsible for this, my brother or sister, Lord, by the time they hear from me, they shall be subject to the will of God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. That's it. You go, hey, brother, how are you doing? What's going on? You talk about politics or whatever, then you introduce Jesus. Boom. You don't let the, the, the discussion go too far. Then you bring Jesus in. Then discussion has started. Or you do what I just said. Say, hello, how are you? God bless you. This is who I am. Or if you somebody you know, say, hey, I forgot. I've not prayed with you before. Can we just pray? Say, oh, wow. Let's pray. You hold hands and you start to pray. God will begin to do something. And many of you try it this week and you see. We have a challenge that we have been doing. We call it no soul left behind. Let heaven full and let earth empty. Because God is doing something in this time. Let the Spirit of God lead you. Because the Bible said, before they went out to begin to witness, uh, Jesus said, you don't have the ability yet. Tarry you in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 1, um, until the Holy Ghost is come. I want you to see. Because I tell you, you must, have, you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, um, look at verse, verse 8. Uh, let's start before verse 4, when Jesus began to talk to them. Acts chapter 1, it says, And being assembled together, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. But wait for the promises of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And in verse 8, he told them that they should wait. He said, But you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall become a witness. So when the power come upon you, it's a power to set you on fire for witnessing. There's a power that you receive is for your own consumption. At salvation, you receive the Holy Ghost for your consumption. The, the one that will teach you everything. That's the one we do in John chapter 1 verse 12. The Bible says, as men that receive him, then he gave power to become the sons of God. That is the power of new identity. The power of salvation, the power to transform you, the power of sonship. But this time now, you have been a son, you have been a daughter, you are growing with God, you are enjoying the palace and all the goodies in the house of God. Sicknesses are going away, frustration is out, your family, there's peace now, things are happening for you. You can't just keep it, you have to share it now. So God said, don't just go, but go with the Holy Spirit. He said, and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall become witness both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost part. So if you have not gone past Jerusalem, you are still not doing much. God says you have to be, look at, if you go down to verse 8, he says, you shall win souls, witness to me. In Jerusalem, that is your, your domain. So if you are in Atlanta, where we are, Atlanta shall be your Jerusalem. Or let's say, I'm in Lilbon here. Lilbon or Gwinnett County is my Jerusalem. And in Judea, so God is not suggesting Judea. Judea is not, oh, you can do in Jerusalem or Judea. No, it's, 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 a, it's a command. You shall be witness in Jerusalem and in Judea. And now we have a device, we have a phone. So this can even take you to the uttermost part of the earth. You don't have to go to Europe or go to India or go to Africa to win somebody. Just at the click of sharing the word of God on your page as we are preaching now, you have began to go outside your shores and your sphere of influence. So in Judea and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part. So when you have done Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, you are still maybe in America. You say, no, 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 we have souls in Mexico. We have souls in Canada. You begin to win them. And it's getting easier now because of the internet, because of cell phone, because of all these gadgets on your laptop. You can now get to the whole world. So let's go and make God happy. Hallelujah. Heaven full and hell empty. That's what we are saying. In the name of Jesus Christ. Because of our time, we are going to pray. Amen. Next week, we are going to continue. I don't have time to go through all of them here. But God will help us to continue next week. To begin to fulfill the will of God. Next week, we are going to talk about you should have a good testimony. Testimony is one of the greatest ways to win soul. Don't just go there and say, God loves you. You say, God loves you and God loves me. Let me tell you what God did in my life. And you say a little bit of sorry that you know you don't have to take somebody's testimony. But you can. But if you, it, it, it gets so close when you talk about yourself. 
I used to dance in the club and God transformed my life. This is where I, I met a minister one day. I went out somewhere and this lady walked in. She has a presence. Ha! When she walked in, everybody knew she was there. She didn't say a word. So after we finished having the meeting, prayers was offered and we prayed and it was the time of fellowshipping. People were going, picking something, drinking coffee. So one of the pastors began to talk to her. And uh, she says she, she's an evangelist. And, uh, you know, they start to give. So the, 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 the host now introduced her. Say, ah, oh, this is lady. We met her in this, this this place. And she told us that she's a dancer. She danced in clubs and all that. And um, they continued to talk to her. She was open to that, but she was also afraid. She had a daughter, and she has to feed her daughter. She has bills and all that. She didn't know how God, but do you know that discussion, they were in relationship with these people, and for about two, three years, God transformed her from being somebody that danced in nightclubs to being somebody that preached the word of God. Today she's on the TV because that when we went to that meeting, she, she was on this um, WSB, what's it called? There's this um, Atlanta um, Gospel TV that's in Norcross. So she has a show there. But she was a dancer. God can win anybody. The criminal on the cross of Calvary, the Bible says two criminals were on the right and the left of Jesus Christ. And when the one was one of them was mocking Jesus, say if you are the son of God, just help yourself. And why should you die like us, like common man and all that? And the other one was shutting him, say, This man they didn't do anything. We are criminals. And he looked at Jesus and said, Sir, please remember me when you enter into your paradise. That means he has heard the word of God somewhere. Both of them have, have had it. But the other guy on the right side said, Please, sir, remember me. He was sober. He said, I committed this offense, I deserve to die. But you, I know, you didn't do anything. Remember me when you enter into your prayer. Jesus said today, not tomorrow, today. Jesus looked at him and said, tonight, thou shalt be with me in paradise. A, a condemned criminal. So God is preparing souls. Let's go and make heaven happy. Father, we thank you for my brother, for my sister, for as many that have heard the sound of my voice as we go and make heaven full and hell empty. Help us to speak the right word. Help us to be composed. Help us to have compassion. Help us to minister to people and touch their soul. Not their body. Not their, their life. Not any, but their soul. Because the soul is, you are interested in every soul. And the devil is also interested in souls. Many that are listening to the sound of my voice today that want to give their life to Christ, I want to give you this opportunity. I want you to say, Father God, I believe with my heart that Jesus Christ died and was raised for my sins. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my Lord. Jesus come into my life. Jesus Christ come into my life. Jesus Christ come into my life. Congratulations again. God bless you. You are a Christian. You are born again. Join a Bible believing church. Connect with us. Write us. Find somebody to grow with. Look for a team, a partner, a ministry, and your life will never be the same again. I love you with all my heart. I'm sorry for the lateness we were involved in this network thing, but finally we got connected. I will be with you tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be prayer, prayer, prayer. Hallelujah. We are going to go into the camp of the enemy. We are going to tear something down. I'm, I'm doing some studies. I'm going to bring some things. We are going to deal with demonologies, mysticisms. We are going to go into necromancy. Every altar, powers from the grave, veck, heck, neck, every authority that is against you. The power of God is going to bring them down tomorrow. But I love you with all my heart and above all, Jesus loves you too. I will see you tomorrow. God bless you. Can we just share this on our wall? And we are doing very well. Maybe by tomorrow we are going to hit a thousand on our YouTube channel. I'm going to give you the good news when it happens. God bless you. Bye.